grafted by you in, in my mother's womb. And you think about me all the time. Your thoughts about me, Lord, are precious. I cannot count the number of times that you think of me. What does that tell us? We have value. God put us together meaning something, worth something. Our existence matters and has value. Paul echoes that same kind of idea in Ephesians 2.10. He says there in the New Living Translation, we are God's masterpiece. We are God's masterpiece. Uh, there was a t-shirt that somebody wore in third grade in Mrs. Grostefone's class in Winnemac, Indiana, uh, 1970 something that said God don't make no junk I haven't seen one of those in about 35 years but I believe it's still true God doesn't make junk God doesn't make garbage he makes his children he makes you and I to have value we're made in his image we are a we'll use some other uh, popular terms now. We are handcrafted, artisanal, small batch creations of the maker of the universe. We are crafted after a divine pattern. Now, I think that's big. And I think that's cool. And I think that's something that we need to make sure that we pay attention to. When we look at how our lives are potentially filled with chaos when it comes to our own personal lives, our own selves, we need to remember, first of all, that God created us in his image and we have value. He didn't make us up out of leftovers and spare pieces. It's precious and valuable. Now, I'll, I'll say, that's a great beginning for a sermon. If I was going to write a sermon about how to take care of myself, I would definitely start there reminding myself that I really do have value and I matter in God's eyes. Now, here's the thing. that this, this is the twist, the fatal flaw. Most of us do not acknowledge or remember that truth. And it is evidenced in the way that we care for ourselves. We are hand-tooled. We are artfully designed by God. But yet we treat this incredible creation of God with very little thought or care. I'm not going to spend the next 25 minutes berating you about what you're eating or drinking or how you're sleeping or how little you exercise. We're just going to throw out one sentence to cover all of that because we all know that it's true. <clears throat> Bad diet, poor exercise, sleep deprived, addicted, burned out, stressed out, worn out. Our lives are constantly draining us. God has this incredible image, this incredible pattern, this plan for our lives, but yet we manage to drive all of the joy, uh, to, to drive most of the, the, the art and the beauty and the meaning out of those lives. We're not taking care of ourselves. If you have children in your home, whether they're your own or grandchildren or some other small people who are watching, I will tell you that the way that you are caring for your body now is probably the way that those young people will take care of themselves later on. The way parents manage their bodies is the way that kids will manage their bodies as well. I promise you that small children will take care of their temple exactly the same way that their parents treat theirs. And some of you are already thinking, oh no, they'll do way better than I am. They won't act just like me. Where are they going to get that? How are they going to pick that up? Who's modeling that for them? Slim Goodbody is no longer on TV. Three of you know who he is. 
But there's, there's not really anybody else in their life who is going to show them the right way to care for this beautiful and artistic and incredibly functional body that God has given to them. Managing our health should include managing a variety of areas. Where are we? Where, where are you and I when it comes to our sleep or our hydration or nutrition? Where are we when it comes to our personal hygiene and exercise? How about our self-image and the, the treatment of the medical conditions that we already have in our own lives? Are we actually managing those areas? Or are we allowing them to run amok, spiraling out of control faster and faster, farther and farther out of our reach? If we see that our, our self is so very far out of whack. It would be very easy to get overwhelmed and to just give up. But if I was going to preach a sermon about this, I would say, don't let that happen. Don't give up. Let's not, let's not give in to overwhelm. Let's consider this instead. If I were to choose to improve any area of my life, which one would make the biggest impact in my quality of life right now? With all the things that are out of control in my life, with all the chaos that there is physically in my life, if I was just going to pick one of those that would have a massive impact on all the rest of my life, which one would it be? Okay, now, we're not just going to name it. We're going to do something about it. Let's focus on that one and make some changes. Don't try to be all girly about this, okay? And try to, to manage 19 things at the same time. Pretend you're all men and you can only do one thing at a time, okay? We're just going to focus on the one. Laser beam on this one issue. Okay, where, where is the one area where you could have the most impact on your life right now? No multitasking, laser focused. There are some people who would advocate some intensive self-care. That's a, a, a new thing which is uh, really popular right now, self-care. Um, and there's another word that goes along with it, usually called mindfulness. Um, they would suggest that if you're having chaos in your personal life, if your self is out of control, that through mindfulness techniques that you bring uh, yourself back into balance. Things like reducing stress, going for a walk. Mindfulness in self-care means that as you have dessert, that you savor every morsel and you, you try to identify each one of the flavors that is exploding on your palate. That you are fully in that, that moment. That you go and you appreciate the, the textures and the, um, the shapes and the colors in, in art. You stand on the beach and you contemplate the ocean. Or as you hike, you wonder at the mountains. Or you go for a country drive and look at the row upon row of crops that are growing. It's all nice. But I think there's a danger in that. What that seems to, to me is that you are just ignoring what the real issues are. For example, <clears throat> let's assume 
uh, that through some freak accident, probably involving a seven-year-old, that our geriatric llama is now in the middle of the living room in our house. He looks bad, he smells bad, and he's really not any fun to be around. So to deal with this ugly, angry llama in our living room, we decide we're going to paint the walls. We're going to uh, put down new flooring. We're just going to go for a walk. We're going to take a five-day vacation and pamper ourselves. Joshua is still making llama beans in the living room. <laughs> Nothing has really been dealt with. I think it's good to give ourselves some breaks like that to reduce stress and to find, uh, to try to find our place in the universe by, by looking at the beauty of nature and the vastness of God's creation. But the danger in this self-care approach is that there is so much focus on self that those people become self-absorbed and self-centered and they're no good to anybody else ever again. We need to remember that we are created by God. We are in his image. We have his spirit in us. There's something that we're supposed to be doing. Granted, life can be difficult and chaotic, but that doesn't mean we just try to distance ourselves from, from the reality that we're in. Let's, let's not just uh, do so much navel-gazing that, uh, that we become oblivious to the rest of the world around us. We don't want to just look inward. We want to make sure that we are looking Godward. I think the self-care thrust misses something very, very important. Being fixated on self doesn't really answer the hardest questions or solve the deepest problems. The llama is still in the living room. Now, I agree that in our chaos, we should seek purpose and meaning in something much bigger than ourselves, and we should embrace it. We need the healing and the forgiving and the restoring and transforming grace of a God who loves us, not just the overwhelming magnitude of nature. Only someone who is stronger than our greatest weaknesses, who is bigger than our worst failures and brighter than our deepest darkness can address the things that we fear or regret or have anxiety about. The things that are causing chaos in our lives. See, it is in a relationship with God that we find fatherly providence. Jesus says that God cares for the sparrows and for the flowers of the field in Matthew 6. Uh, and he says that we are more, worth way more than they are. That's Luke chapter 12, verse 7. We can trust God to care for our needs. In a relationship with God, we find meaning and purpose for life. Not just that we exist and we're, we're supposed to be nice but that there's real meaning and purpose. He created us to know him and to be known by him, to enjoy that relationship with him forever. And because God himself designed you and created you, he has a specific purpose and specific plans for your life. When life is all chaotic and we feel like everything is spiraling out of control in our own selves, we can go for a walk. We can even have some really good dessert. But we need to remember that what we really need most is to talk to our Father in heaven and to have him bring the healing and the vision and the direction and everything else that, that we need. Scripture gives us some, um, I think, very practical things when it comes to caring for ourselves, for our own physical health and, and our, our own physical needs. 
Um, there are verses like this one. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? About three chapters later in uh, chapter 6, Paul says, Glorify God in your body. You are bought with a price. God's Holy Spirit lives inside your body, his temple. And so you really ought to take good care of it. You would never bring a llama inside. Don't even think about doing that. Instead, we need to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. That's Romans 12, 1. We want to make sure that God knows that everything that we are and everything that we have, heart, mind, soul, and strength, all of that belongs to him. He is to use it as he sees fit. All he has to do is just keep us moving and we'll go. We do things that are holy, righteous, acceptable to God. Uh, back in the book of Daniel, uh, at, the, at the very beginning of the book, uh, Daniel and his friends are offered um, some wonderful things uh, from the king's table. And the, the answer of these good Jewish young men is, we don't want to defile ourselves with these things. I think that is an excellent approach for us to take because God's image lives inside us. We are made in his image and his Holy Spirit is in us. We are the temple of God's Holy Spirit. We don't want to do anything that would defile that place and make it unholy. Bad food, bad images, bad substances, bad anything. We don't want to defile it. We want it to be used as it was intended. You don't feed the dog on grandma's wedding china. It's special. It's for a, a special purpose. It's not to be used in a disgusting or gross or defiling way. Uh, Paul says in Philippians 4 verse 8, Instead of focusing on things that can draw us away, defiling things, he says, whatever is true, Noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And then he says, whatever you've learned or seen or heard from me or received from me, put it into practice. Don't just think about the good things that you've heard. You need to make sure that those, uh, those things have legs and feet, that those are moving around, that they're growing in your life. Let's fill this temple with good things, not with bad things, and then make sure that they're continually being um, watered and, and nurtured. Uh, that's what Ephesians 5.29 tells us. It says that uh, no man hates his own body. Instead, he, he cares for it. He feeds it. He, he nurtures that body just the same way that Christ does the church. We want to make sure that we're doing things every single day that help us to grow in our relationship with Jesus. We want to be closer to him. We want to be more like him. I will say this, though, that even in the best of circumstances, when you are actively pursuing uh, pursuing God's ministry, when you're working hard for him and serving all the time and you are trying to be as close as you can, there can still be moments of being overwhelmed. What are you talking about, James? Remember old Elijah? Elijah had this idol worship showdown on the top of Mount Carmel. 850 prophets and false gods. They sang and they danced and they cut themselves and they bled and they sang and they danced and nothing happened all day long. Elijah said, now it's my turn. And he called down God, the God of Israel, to do something. And he did. And God showed up in a huge way. And all the people saw God show up in a huge way. Idol worship was effectively eliminated at that moment. And on top of this, this mountaintop experience that Elijah, the prophet, had with God, you know where we find him in about 15 minutes after he got off the mountain? Oh, man, I wish I was dead. I'm the only one. What am I going to do? 
even in great moments of, of ministry success and spiritual success, we can still get drained and we can still feel alone and distressed. And God didn't say, you little twerp, what is wrong with you? You're out. You're fired. Bring on the next guy. No. God propped him up and he gave him some food and he gave him some water and he let him rest. And then he brought him some food and he brought him some water and he let him rest. God provided for his needs. God restored him and eventually Elijah went on um, to an incredible experience with God on, uh, on the side of the mountain. God restored him even when he was broken. God wants to restore people. He doesn't get down on them and angry at them for their failures. When they are earnestly and intentionally seeking direction, when they really uh, have, have a broken heart about the way that their lives are, God brings restoration. Jesus didn't say, all you people who are making mistakes and screwing up, go away from me. All you people who don't seem to have quite enough faith because you're depressed or you're having anxiety, you can't sleep at night, you're, you're drinking way too much, you're medicating yourself with food, whatever it is that you're doing, he doesn't say, get out, go away. You're a disappointment. Instead, Jesus says, come. Come, all you who are weary and burdened, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus does not intend for you to continue feeling like garbage because your life is not going the way that you want it to. He does want you to come to him to find direction and peace and meaning and purpose and healing and restoration. That's what he wants. So on my notes here, I, I made a little a little point to say something like this. So let's work harder at caring for our own bodies, minds, and souls this week. That seems a little contradictory to what we've just been talking about. I don't know if you need to work harder at it. I, I do believe that you need to take a real good hard look at the way that things are. Why can't you sleep? Why do you think you have no appetite? Why do you think your appetite is out of control? Is there something underneath the surface that you need to get some help with? Let me urge you, find some help. Your pastor would love to talk to you. If you need a referral for something that's a little hairier and scarier than I'm comfortable dealing with, I, I got names. We'll find a way for you to get the help that you need so that you can be whole and healthy physically, mentally, spiritually. Don't believe that this is all on you. Now, some of it may be. You might need to work harder at just turning out of the pantry, going outside, or shutting the ice cream freezer door. That may be the deal. That you don't buy another package of cigarettes or another case of beer or whatever that is on you he he wants to bring healing to you he doesn't want you to live in chaos physically and third john uh, there's a, a little prayer from uh, from john that I hadn't paid much attention to until a friend mentioned it a couple of months ago. It says there, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. You ever heard that verse before? Let me read it again. I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all, 
all things may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. That's my prayer. I want you to do well emotionally, relationally. I want you to do well physically. And that may mean that when we start getting back together all the time and uh, we get things back in full force, that we have to make some changes in the things that we eat and drink as a congregation. Maybe, maybe there'll be some, some new thinking about what we can do to make sure that we're all healthier, that we're all making better choices together as a church family, that the body is getting strengthened all the time. Let's pray, and then uh, we'll move on to some thoughts about the Lord's Supper. If you're, uh, if you're out watching us this morning online, uh, let me encourage you to take a moment here to, uh, to grab uh, the communion elements. Uh, you'll be ready with us to partake in just a few moments. But let's, let's pray right now. Father, I do pray that my brothers and sisters here and everywhere would enjoy good health, that things would go well with them, that their souls would get along well and that their bodies um, would follow suit. Lord, we're grateful for how wonderfully and incredibly you have put our bodies together. There are things that doctors still don't really understand. They're all really smart. But we know that you created us um, beautifully and scientifically and... Um, incredibly. Uh, thank you for that. Would you please remind us each day that we bear your image and because of that we want, um, we want to live our lives in a way that honors you. Thank you Father for, um, for creating us and for giving us your constant care. It is in the name of Jesus Christ our Savior we pray. Amen. <clears throat> the Lord's Supper um, keeps our faith strong. We've talked a little bit now this morning about keeping our bodies healthy and strong. The Lord's Supper, communion, helps us to keep our faith strong by reminding us on a regular basis that it is Jesus who has made forgiveness possible. Now, when we're together uh, for communion, we often use uh, a few moments of silence to think back on the past week, to recount mistakes that we've made, uh, failures that we've given into, the sin. We, we remember how far we have fallen. I would caution you to follow Jesus' own words. He says... That's burned right there in the front of the table. Every communion table in North America has the same words. Do this in remembrance of me. It's probably significant that it doesn't say, do this in remembrance of your sin. Do this in remembrance of your guilt. Do this in remembrance of your failure. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, it is not wrong for us to reflect and, and to examine ourselves, but let's not forget that this meal, this bread and wine, is his meal. And it focuses on his life and death and his sacrifice and his forgiving nature, his grace and his mercy. We do this every single week in remembrance of me to keep Jesus before our minds and hearts constantly. We do not want to lose our connection to Jesus, the one who has made everything possible for us. So as you wait today for the emblems to come to you and before we all partake together in just a few moments, you can think about your sins, but remember that they are under the blood of Jesus, and because of that, you will have eternity with him. Man, if you'd like to go ahead and distribute them.
Jesus invites every believer to partake in this meal. Whether you're a member of this congregation or not, if, if you understand the sacrifice that he has made for you, he invites you to remember his body and his blood. So if you uh, will uh, we'll have those elements ready uh, in just a moment, we'll partake together. Okay, if you would have the elements ready. Father, as sinners who are in desperate and eternal need of your grace and mercy, we share together this bread remembering the life and the example of Jesus. Lord, together we share this cup remembering the forgiveness that you grant through the shed blood and death of Jesus. Father, we thank you for Christ Jesus and through Christ Jesus. Amen. I'm very glad uh, that you were able to be here with us today, uh, both live in the building and uh, way out there, wherever you are. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Uh, may God guide you and bless you this week.